one second to arrive. I need to. So who, Martin, who's going to call you tomorrow, by the way? Do you know? Who's nice it? car. He promised me that he will call me as soon as the decision has been made. Okay. Who is the person? The... That was the DFG representative from oh, I see, I see, I see. who was here. Unfortunately, we do not have any more a member in the Senate. Or do you know somebody? No, I don't know anybody. I don't, I'm not connected to the political side of Germany. Uh, okay. One second. That's all right. It's a good thing. <laughs> you don't want me in the political side of Germany. <laughs> um, all right. So let me start this since officially the time. Um, can you guys, oh, by the way, can you see this or can you see the the wrong one? Which one are you seeing, by the way? Yeah, the correct one, yeah? No, I think I see what, what should be on your computer. It's like yeah, this one is better? Presenter, yeah. Oh, it's better. No, it's good. Ah, sorry. Uh, it's just because I have two now and since I don't know what to do. Okay, good. Um, uh, so thank everybody for arriving, to, for coming again to the online SPICE SPIN Plus X seminars. Um, that I lead here uh, together with uh, Libush Mekiel, Angela, Angela uh, Wittmann, and Karen Eversusite now in Duisburg. Uh, and we do this in collaboration with the SPIN Plus X uh, Collaborative Research Center, uh, led by Martin Schliemann and uh, uh, Burkhard Hillebrands in Kastuslaten and Matthias Chloe in Mainz. As you know, this is a webinar format, uh, meaning that uh, you can only see the speaker on the people in the panel uh, and but please raise your hand and I will open now the chat as well that you can write any questions that you have in there directly for us. Uh, now we begin to have a much, much fuller schedule as you may have seen. Uh, please uh, check out the, uh, the schedule uh, that for the upcoming talks uh, that now that are much better. And uh, with this I would like to introduce the speaker for today's uh, Tali uh, Giasi, I'm sorry, I, I must have put you, you the, the way you, you would please, please pronounce it for us after when you start, if you don't mind. Uh, but she, uh, I invited her, she's actually uh, a fantastic uh, student uh, from, um, uh, uh, they was in, in Groningham, as uh, in uh, Bert's uh, team, and then uh, moved on to a postdoc in UT Delft, and then with the Ruby Composer Card Fellowship, she's now in Harvard, uh, working on charts and spin transparent two dimensional systems and graphene and Van der Waals heterostructures. And uh, she gave a magnificent uh, several prizes, the Minerva Prize as well. And she gave a magnificent talk at the Gordon Research Conference uh, in July. And I wanted that she also could share that with us uh, and the more broader community. Uh, so we would like to see you and hear you. So please go ahead and. Uh, start sharing your screen when you have a chance and start your talk when you're ready. Thank you, Yairo, for the kind introduction. Um, I first would like to start by thanking you and the other organizers of uh, the SPICE seminars for creating such an amazing platform that allows us to share our scientific output with the rest of the world. Um, and of course, I'm really grateful for having the opportunity today to um, present the research that I have been involved in in the past several years uh, in the Netherlands done in these two Dutch universities. So I was in Groningen um, for my PhD. I was working with a group of uh, uh, Barton Vase, and there we were exploring spin transport in the diffusive regime in these graphene-based Van der Waals heterostructures. And then I moved on to uh, TU Delft where we uh, are we were trying to uh, explore the quantum pole regime of these heterostructures at the group of Hera van der Zandt. Um, well, the motivation behind this research is uh, lying in understanding of how graphene-based spintronic devices work and what is the actual bottleneck for their applications. Well, um, it's been now clear for all of us that graphene is known as an excellent material for the purpose of charge and spin transport, and that is thanks to its high charge carrier mobility and low spin orbit coupling, which allows it to transfer the spins over relatively long distances, which is uh, achieved to be 30 micrometer experimentally in this work recently. 
Well, in this conventional geometry of spintronic devices, we are using cobalt electrodes for the purpose of spin injection and detection. And the reason for that is that cobalt electrodes are ferromagnetic, um, meaning that there is this imbalance of the density of states for spin up and spin down electrons at the Fermi energy. So if you apply a charge current through your cobalt contact, that charge current is gonna be spin polarized. So with that, you can actually inject your spin into your graphene channel, and that would shift the electrochemical potential for spin up versus spin down, and that would create a spin accumulation in your graphene channel. Now, you can pick up the spin accumulation or your spin signal in the graphene channel, um, but you have to consider that the spin accumulation is going to exponentially drop as you go further away from the cobalt injector contact. And that is because there are spin scattering and split, spin flip mechanisms involved that is going to basically kill your spin signal um, as a function of distance. So if you want to pick up your spin signal, you would have to put your detector contact somewhere on the way before the spin accumulation fully vanishes like this. This is called a non-local measurement geometry where the charge current is dissociated from the voltage probe circuit. But the injected spins can diffuse towards the left and the right side of the channel, meaning that at this part of the channel, the charge current is zero, but the spin current can have its finite non-zero value. So if you're using cobalt also as the detector contact, then the electrochemical potential at the detector contact can be related to the spin accumulation alone. So you can basically pick up this voltage over the charge current, and that would give you your non-local resistance, which is your spin signal that you can pick up, for example, in this parallel configuration of the magnetization of the electrodes as a positive non-local resistance. Now, these cobalt electrodes, um, the injector and detector, are made with different geometrical widths, so they have different coercive fields. So if you apply a magnetic field along the easy axis of the cobalt contacts, then uh, you can switch them one by one. So first, the wider one would switch. So in this case, the injector contact, and that would inject spin downs this time. And that would create a negative spin accumulation at the position of the detector contact, which is getting picked up as a negative non-local resistance for this anti-parallel configuration of the magnetization of the electrodes. Now, if you increase the magnetic field further, you are going to switch the magnetization of the cobalt detector as well and create this parallel configuration. And that's why the spin signal goes back to its positive initial value. So this shows that in this conventional spin valve, uh, spintronic devices, we can actually have these two levels of resistance, which is working based on the direction of our spin. And that is why it is called the spin valve. You can also try to play with the direction of the injected spins and that you can do by uh, applying a magnetic field that is perpendicular to the direction of the injected spins. In this case, the spins are starting to rotate or process around the magnetic field. And by that, your non-local resistance is getting modified. So you can manipulate your spin signal by the application of magnetic field. You could uh, make a sort of a logic operation here or manipulation of the uh, signal with using external field. And that is actually the problem because we are relying on this external magnetic field uh, for such operation. And that is not really compatible for our electronic circuitry. So if you want to think about future devices like prospective applications, we need to find a way to sort of get rid of this magnetic field and try to manipulate our spin signal electrically. And that's why people started questioning the usage of these cobalt contacts, because if you think about it, um, if you want to like electrically manipulate the direction of the injected spins, that means that you're hoping to uh, push the Fermi energy from this situation when you have majority spin up to this situation where you, where you have majority spin down. But this electrostatic control over the Fermi energy in a metal is basically impossible. So we want to go beyond this conventional geometry of spin injection by cobalt contact. And this is basically the essence of the research that we are doing here to find a way out. And what we are proposing is that instead of using cobalt, we actually focus on the graphene itself and try to tailor its graph, its uh, band structure. 
and make it spin split. So if you make the band structure of graphene spin split, then you can give graphene itself some spin related functionalities. And that you can do by inducing spin orbit coupling or exchange interaction in graphene. How to do so? Well, there is one um, very non-invasive way uh, to do that without modifying too much the excellent charge transfer properties in graphene, and that is by the proximity effect, which tells us that if you bring graphene in the close proximity of other two-dimensional material, there can be an overlap between their electronic wave function, which would um, basically allow for combining their properties. So you can sort of make a new material with the combined properties of each individual layer. And so uh, we are looking now at the library of other two-dimensional materials. There we can find a family of transition metal decalcogenides, which are known to have very strong spin orbit coupling. Um, or we can find the family of magnetic materials, which are known to have strong exchange interaction. <clears throat> and now we want to see what will happen if you bring them in the proximity of graphene. Well, I'm going to start first with graphene TMD heterostructures. I think uh, probably for most of the people in the audience, it's already known how the band structure of the TMD looks like. Um, so they have uh, strong out-of-plane Valley-Zeyman spin orbit fields that is changing sign from one valley to the other, and that is creating a very strong spin splitting in K and K prime valley, which is opposing sign. And now, if you bring TMD in the proximity of graphene, you can induce this strong Valley-Zeyman spin orbit field in the graphene itself, and it is going to be as such that it's also changing sign from one valley to the other. And if you consider this situation, you can imagine that the in-plane spins in graphene are going to be affected by these out-of-plane spin orbit fields. They are going to start precessing, and so they are going to deface as a result of that. So uh, if that happens, you can imagine that the lifetime of the in-plane spin is going to be quite short in comparison to out-of-plane spins that are not being affected by this out-of-plane spin orbit fields. So if there is a strong uh, valley Zeman spin orbit field induced in graphene, then we are expecting to see a large spin lifetime anisotropy. And this is what we want to explore here. Well, the Handler precession measurement that I showed you earlier on is uh, actually quite useful for exploring spin lifetime anisotropy because you can imagine that the spins that are injected are being rotated around the magnetic field. So you are generating out-of-plane spins also in this case. So you can sort of compare the dynamics of the in-plane versus out-of-plane spins and see uh, how would this behavior change when you are bringing TMD on top. And this is what we explore here. We bring a monolayer MOSE2 in the uh, proximity of graphene, and we indeed see that our handle precession is showing a uh, different behavior. So what I see here is that um, at zero magnetic field, the moment that the spins have not processed yet, they're just in the plane, um, the non-local resistance is having a very small signal. But then as soon as you apply a magnetic field of around um, 0.1 uh, Tesla, it's already sufficient to rotate the spins out of the plane. And then those spins are going to survive for longer time and that would give rise to a much larger, like one order of magnitude larger spin signal coming from the out-of-plane spins. So by this measurement, we can actually quantify the lifetime of the in-plane and out-of-plane spins, which tells us that um, uh, the lifetime for the out-of-plane spins is about like 10 times larger than that of in-plane. So there is a strong spin lifetime and isotropy in this system. There are also the other uh, works that um, um, are done by um, the group of uh, Sergio Valenzuela and also group of Felix Casanova in this area of the field, which uh, worth taking a look at. Well, now that we know that there must be a strong spin orbit coupling induced in graphene, then we can wait for the emergence of charge to spin conversion phenomena, such as a spin uh, Hall effect. Um, how to measure this? Well, that you can measure by making a Hall bar of graphene in the proximity of TMD, and then um, you would need to use non-magnetic electrodes just to apply current, to apply an in-plane electric field, and then because of the presence of out-of-plane spin orbit fields, 
due to the spin hall effect, the trajectory of spin up and spin down electrons is going to be in the opposite direction, which is creating a spin current that is perpendicular to the direction of the charge current and the spin orbit field. Um, and of course, you can always use your uh, cobalt ferromagnetic electrodes to pick up the spin signal, but know that this is not needed uh, for the generation of the spins. This is just for picking up the spin and making sure that the generated signal is spin polarized. So you know that cobalt electrode has the magnetization uh, along its um, easy axis. So if you want to pick up the spin signal, you would have to rotate the spins in the plane to bring it along with the cobalt and that you can do by applying an external magnetic field. So as soon as there is a field applied, we see that there is a finite value of the non-local resistance picked up. Um, here measured for the first time, the group of Felix Casanova for the case of MOS2 graphene heterostructure. Well, it turns out that not only we are inducing spin orbit uh, coupling of the kind of Bally Zeman, uh, in these heterostructures, there is also Rushba spin orbit field present. And where does it come from? Well, um, when you bring graphene in the proximity of these other two dimensional materials, there is this interfacial electric field that is breaking the out of plane symmetry in the graphene. And that is translated as in plane rush bus spin orbit fields, as I'm showing here by these um, green arrows. And this rush bus spin orbit field is going to create a winding spin texture for the in plane spins as I'm showing here at the Fermi contours uh, at the graphene band structure. Now, if you apply a uh, electric field in the plane of graphene, you can imagine that you, you can create uh, a non-equilibrium condition, which is giving rise to a um, spin accumulation coming from the imbalance that you have created in the density of spins. So you would, by applying an uh, electric field, you would generate a a finite spin accumulation with the spins perpendicular to the direction of the electric field, as I'm showing here. And now we can pick up these uh, spins coming from rushbar edelstein effect um, using still your cobalt contact, but then for picking them up, you would have to push the magnetization of the cobalt along the magnetic field. And as soon as you do that, there is a finite non-local resistance um, that we are picking up, picking it up, um, which is telling us that indeed Rushba Edelstein effect is happening in this system as a proof of the presence of Rushba spin orbit field. Here I would like to highlight the work done uh, by the group of uh, Sergio Valenzuela at ICN2 Barcelona, uh, where they are, they are doing a comprehensive study of both of these effects uh, done in graphene WS2 heterostructure. They can measure uh, these effects up to room temperature and they can quantify the efficiencies of these two effects and uh, compare them showing that the spin hall effects seem to be uh, slightly more efficient than the rush Edelstein. I also would like to uh, say that there is a lot of uh, work done in this area of the field, uh, done at various uh, Van der Waals heterostructures of uh, different kind. For example, there is a lot of work done by the group of uh, Saroj Dash at Chalmers University. Um, for example, this work is on um, uh, TIs and graphene heterostructures. So I suggest the, the audience to also take a look at um, these works done by our colleagues. All right, now that the situation uh, for the case of graphene and TMD heterostructure is quite settled, and we know that by the proximity, we can induce a strong spin orbit coupling, both valley Zeman and Rashba spin orbit field, I would like to move on to our magnetic heterostructures where we uh, promise that when we bring uh, the magnetic material in the proximity of graphene, we can have spin splitting the graphene band structure due to the induced exchange interaction. And as a result of that, the conductivity in graphene is going to be spin dependent. And also we are expecting to see spin dependent Sabek effect. And apart from that, there is a bonus um, when you use magnetic materials uh, because they not only have exchange interaction, but also they have strong spin orbit coupling. And the presence of these two in one system can allow you to detect anomalous Hall effect. And if you bring the system in the quantum Hall regime, you can address quantum, quantum anomalous Hall effect. And uh, today we have just enough time to explore um, all these defects together. 
Well, the first 2D magnet that I'm going to tell you about is chromium sulfur bromide. Um, I call it CSP from now on. Uh, it's an air-stable semiconductor and it's an interlayer antiferromagnet with the magnetization being um, ordered ferromagnetically within the plane along the magnetic easy axis. And it's antiferromagnetically magnetically ordered along the stacking direction. Well, the crystal structure is um, orthorhombic with this like rectangular geometry. So if you exfoliate these crystals, you will be left with this very well-defined rectangular structure um, shape of the flakes, which allows you to determine the magnetic easy and hard axis. So in that sense, it's actually a very nice material to, to immediately start working on because you already know what is the situation with, the, with respect to the magnetic axis. Now, in this case, we are bringing bilayer graphene um, on top of the CSP. And since it is all about the proximity effect, what we care about is the magnetization of the outermost layer of the CSP that can get induced in graphene. And that can uh, basically make the band structure of graphene spin split. And as you see here, then the density of the um, spin up and spin down electrons are going to be different from each other. And as a result, their conductivity is different. And so there will be a uh, spin polarization of conductivity in graphene. And this is what we wanted to explore and see if uh, it is actually true. Um, and um, for that, we are using our cobalt spin sensitive electrodes here fabricated with aluminum oxide as our tunnel barrier. So cobalt is fabricated as such that the easy axis of it is along the easy axis of the CSP, <clears throat> as uh, shown here. Um, this is a side view of this central contact. And if you start with this uh, three terminal measurement geometry, you can um, imagine that the three terminal resistance is basically the interfacial resistance that you have at the cobalt and graphene at this central contact. Now we apply a magnetic field and with that we try to play with this relative orientation of the magnetization of the uh, magnetic elements that we have here and see how would that change the interfacial resistance. <clears throat> Along with that, I am uh, showing you the squid um, measurements that is done separately on a bulk of CSP. And I'm showing that so that we can see what is going on in the bulk of the CSP um, whilst we are playing with the uh, three terminal resistance by the magnetic field applied. So first we are applying an, a strong magnetic field that brings everything into this parallel situation. So the CSP is in this ferromagnetic state. And uh, you see the outermost layer of the CSP and cobalt are, are in this parallel configuration. The moment that we bring the magnetic field down to zero, the CSP is going through this transition. It goes from ferromagnetic to the antiferromagnetic state. However, nothing changed uh, in our interfacial resistance. And this is an important observation because it tells us that what we are measuring here is only about the magnetization induced in graphene by the outermost layer. So we do not care about what is going on underneath in the bulk of CSP. Now, we apply a magnetic field in the opposite direction. Cobalt is pretty soft, so it's gonna switch first. And that is bringing the situation of this outermost layer and cobalt to this anti-parallel configuration. And that's why we have seen a switch in the three terminal resistance, but that field was too small to, to change anything in the bulk of CSP. Now increasing the field further brings everything into this parallel configuration. CSP goes to the ferromagnetic state and we have a switch back to, to our parallel initial value. Of course, you will see the same if you apply the magnetic field in the opposite direction, which is uh, leaving us with this um, three terminal spin valve, which is observed for the first time in graphene. And the reason that the three terminal spin valve is present now in um, our graphene channel is because of the fact that graphene has a finite spin polarization of conductivity, because the change in the three terminal resistance is directly proportional to that. We can also evaluate this using uh, our conventional non-local geometry, uh, which we were um, sort of preferring over the three terminal measurements uh, always, because in this case, you're uh, injecting your current here and detecting your spins elsewhere. You're dissociating your charge current and spin uh, current path. Um, so we are evaluating it uh, now in this case, and uh, you can imagine that here we are dealing with three magnetic elements, the cobalt injector, cobalt de detector, and the magnetization of CSP, and now by applying a magnetic field, 
you can try to play with their relative orientation. So you would switch the magnetization of the injector contact first, and then that of the detector contact. And lastly, you are going to switch the magnetization of the CSP, which is a harder magnet. So it is switching at larger fields. So that leaves us with this uh, rather unconventional three-level non-local spin valve, which is quite different from what we observed um, earlier on in the case of pristine graphene, where we had only a two-level resistance. Here in pristine graphene, the non-local resistance is directly proportional to the polarization of cobalt injector and detector. Um, however, in magnetic graphene, the non-local resistance is having more terms involving the polarization of graphene itself. And from there, we can extract the polarization of cobalt contact injector and detector and the polarization of graphene. And here you see that uh, graphene polarization is about 14%, which is quite comparable with that of cobalt. And that means that when graphene becomes magnetic, it can participate in the process of spin injection and detection with the efficiency that is comparable with that of cobalt electrodes. And this is very important um, uh, to, to realize that graphene is um, acting as an efficient spin injector and detector. And that is whilst it can still keep its relatively long distance spin transport. Well, uh, from here we can um, estimate roughly uh, the, the magnitude of the exchange interaction, uh, exchange field induced in graphene. I'm saying it roughly because we do not know the exact position of the Fermi energy in the graphene in this um, device, um, but we are like estimating, estimating it from another device that uh, we had. Uh, so let's say roughly it is around uh, this magnitude of exchange field, which is quite impressive. Um, to have it so strong. Well, now that uh, we know that uh, there is indeed an, an induced exchange interaction, uh, we might be expecting the, the emergence of other relevant phenomena, such as spin dependence Seebeck effect. By this effect, the thermal gradient in a magnetic system can generate spin current. So for example, here, the thermal gradient in the graphene channel is generated by the current source contact, uh, due to the joule heating, and then that thermal gradient is creating spin accumulation. Those spins are going to diffuse in the channel and then get picked up by our cobalt detector contact. Well, due to the um, dependence of such thermal effects on current squared, uh, if you want to pick up these um, thermal effects, you would have to take a look at the second harmonic of uh, your non-local signal that you can easily do if you are working with a uh, locking technique. Um, it is easily dissociated. Um, and uh, we do that, and this is what we get. We are observing a spin valve in the second harmonic uh, part of our signal as well. And how do we, uh, how do we understand this? Well, um, if you are believing that these uh, spins are generated by uh, the magnetization of graphene and they're having thermal origin, then uh, the direction of the spins are, uh, the direction of the, the spins is defined by the magnetization of the CSP. So uh, now that you are picking them up by your cobalt detector contact, what matters is the relative orientation of the magnetization of the CSP with respect to the cobalt detector, which is going from the parallel configuration to anti-parallel and back to parallel. And that's why you have a two-term, a two-level uh, non-local resistance here. Actually, it's uh, good to compare this with the first harmonic measurement uh, that we saw earlier on. And here you see that the first switch that was related to the switch of the cobalt injector contact is actually absent in this um, uh, second harmonic measurement. Um, and this is important because this assures that the cobalt injector contact is not generating these spins, but these spins are rather having thermal origin. We even take this uh, one step further. We uh, come up with another um, device geometry or design where uh, we are replacing the cobalt injector contact with a non-magnetic gold electrode. Um, and so in this circuitry, the only spin injector element is going to be your magnetic graphene. So the part of the graphene channel where the charge current is passing through is going to inject spin accumulation to the other parts. And then you can pick up the spin accumulation using your cobalt electrode. 
This measurement is also giving us spin valves, both in first and uh, the second harmonic, telling us indeed the magnetic graphene by itself is uh, injecting spins not only electrically, but also thermally. Well, uh, we also took a look at um, the temperature dependence of our signal. We um, know that the CSB, uh, like through the squid magnetometry measurements, the CSB is showing the nail temperature to be about 130 Kelvin. And um, in our measurements, the non-local measurements, as soon as we increase the temperature, when we get close to the 130 Kelvin, we see that the spin signal considerably decays. Uh, which tells us how sensitive the spin signal is uh, to the um, thermal fluctuations of the magnetic moments coming from the substrate. All right. Uh, well, now that we know that there is uh, indeed, indeed induced magnetism, I told you that by the proximity of the uh, these materials, there can be a, a spin orbit coupling induced, uh, which would allow us to observe anomalous Hall effect because the co-presence of these two effects should in principle allow for that. So that is what we are exploring here. We make a whole bar of graphene, we put CSP on top. Uh, we know that the magnetization of the CSP is uh, initially in the plane, but then as soon as we uh, apply an external magnetic field, we can push the magnetization out of the plane, which is going to create out of plane spin polarization. And then due to the spin orbit coupling, the trajectory of these out of plane spins is going to be towards opposite directions. So they are going to get accumulated at the edges of the channel. But then since the system is magnetic, there is an imbalance in the number of these spins. So that imbalance is going to give rise to a finite value of the transverse voltage that is picked up as our anomalous Hall voltage. Well, this anomalous Hall effect uh, component is um, directly proportional to the Z component of the magnetization. So as soon as you bring the magnetization fully out of the plane, then you should have a saturation of your anomalous Hall effect component. And uh, its sign is dependent on the polarization in the graphene. So you can also have the anomalous Hall component of negative sign. But don't forget that if you do such measurements, you will always have the ordinary hull uh, part, which is supposed to be linear uh, in field. And so what you would measure in practice is going to be addition of the two. And this is exactly what we measure in this system. Um, as soon as uh, we like subtract the linear component, we are left with this nonlinear part, which is associated to the anomalous hull effect. It is quite a sizable signal, which is also gate tunable. So when we go further away from the direct point, the signal uh, decays, but still it has its finite value quite far away from the neutrality point. All right, so now uh, having signatures of both spin orbit coupling and magnetism induced in the system, giving rise to the anomalous Hall effect, uh, made us curious to, to see if we can have the quantum anomalous Hall effect in such heterostructures which is one of the most uh, sought after phenomena uh, in these um, systems. And it's actually a, a crowded part of the field. Um, there has been quite a lot of um, like experiments done, but recently there has been two very interesting uh, comprehensive studies uh, done for the case of graphene in the proximity of magnetic insulators. Uh, where they are showing that uh, the Londol fan diagram is is uh, looking rather exotic, quite different from what you would expect in pristine graphene case. You see that here on the left side of the uh, uh, gate voltage, the Londol fan is sort of fanning out, but then on the right side, uh, it is creating plateaus. This is understood by considering an interfacial charge transfer that can happen uh, between the 2D magnet and graphene at particular range of the gate voltage. It is an important observation because it tells us that for such measurements, you have to be careful. Not only you should go for a magnetic material, which is having insulated pro properties, it's not conductive, but also you should be uh, aware of the band alignments that uh, graphene can have with respect to the 2D magnet. 
Um, and for that reason, because we have been seeing that in some ranges of gate voltage, there is some activation of uh, charge transfer happening for the case of graphene CSP, we moved on to another 2D magnetic material, which is in this case chromium phosphor sulfide, um, which is uh, also a semiconductor, but later on you will see that the situation is going to be uh, different for this 2D magnet. Well, um, CPS uh, is also an interlayer antiferromagnet, but then with the magnetization being mainly out of the plane with slight tilt with respect to the C axis. Here you see the top view of the crystals and uh, that can allow you to determine the in-plane magnetic A and B axis. And how to determine that? Well, it uh, seems like that if you cleave the crystals, they will be cleaved along the chromium atoms, and that will be leaving you with such flakes with this 67.5 degrees of angle. And the bisector of that angle would, would be your magnetic A axis. And so if you want to put your graphene hull bar on top, you can align your channel with respect to one of these magnetic axes. Um, and now if you want to um, proceed, you need to also know the magnetic behavior of the CPS so that we are exploring with discrete magnetometry. Um, so as I said, the magnetization is initially mainly out of the plane with slight tilt of 20 degrees with respect to C-axis. But then what happens is that as soon as you apply a magnetic field, the magnetization goes uh, undergoes a spin-flop transition. So it goes to the plane, still it is anti-ferromagnetically uh, aligned, but then they are still, they are going to be in the plane. But then as soon as you apply a magnetic, a stronger magnetic field, there can be a canting of the magnetization, which is giving rise to a finite value of the magnetization picked up by a squid. And uh, increasing the magnetic field further is going to linearly increase the picked up magnetization up to the saturation that is happening around a Tesla. So there are like two regimes that are important for us. One is what is happening below one Tesla, which is our spin flop transition, and what is happening above a Tesla, which is our the, the saturation of the magnetization. Now we want to see whether we can see the reflection of this magnetic behavior in the transport going on um, in our graphene hull bar that is placed on top. Here we are covering the graphene channel with HBN, and then we are having also a top gate, which allows us to access the Fermi energy in the graphene band structure. All right, here we are uh, going to first start with the uh, transverse resistance measured as a function of magnetic field, so the Hall uh, effect, basically. Um, and this is what we get. We are seeing switches of the transverse resistance happening around 0.8 Tesla, which is exactly the field where we were seeing the spin flop transition uh, going on in the CPS. So this already shows that there is something being sensed by our graphene channel coming from the magnet underneath. Focusing at what is going on here shows that um, both on the trace and retrace, we are having switches. Uh, so we are having spin flop transition going and then on the way back again, there is an, uh, another trans spin flop transition, which is uh, bringing the crystal back to its initial condition. And this tells us that um, even though graphene is in the proximity of this outermost layer, which is a ferromagnet, but still the dynamics of this uh, outermost layer is ruled by its anti-ferromagnetic coupling um with respect to the layers underneath so you could also think about such measurement as a tool uh, to sort of probe the magnetization behavior of the outermost layer here you see that on the way back actually there is quite a large hysteresis which is absent in the squid measurements so that means that the outermost layer even though it's going through the spin flop transition but it is sort of lagging behind that can be due to uh, the fact that it is only having one uh, layer as the neighbor. So in any case, such measurements can also be informative because it's very sensitive to the behavior of the outermost layer, which is not the case in uh, for most of the other measurement techniques, which is mainly about the magnetization behavior of the bulk of the crystal. Now, let me move on uh, with our uh, transport done in this device. So um, here I'm showing you the modulation of the resistivity as a function of gate voltage, which is basically our Dirac curve. 
Um, and what is um, like um, interesting to us uh, here for this Dirac curve is the fact that there seem to be something going on uh, close to the Dirac point. There seem to be like emergence of shoulders as if, or like accumulation of data points. And then as soon as we increase the magnetic field slightly, we see that they are evolving into these oscillations of resistivity, namely Shutnikov the has oscillations. So that means that already at zero magnetic field, or very uh, small fields, as if the system is very close to the onset of quantum Hall regime. So the, there, there is there are signatures for uh, the formation of uh, Londo levels already at very small magnetic field. Considering the fact that the mobility of graphene in these devices is rather poor, that means that there must be a strong magnetic field coming from the magnet underneath that allows for such observation. We uh, keep increasing the magnetic field, which is going to make our Landau levels more and more uh, dissociated up to the magnetic field of nine Tesla, which is available in our system. Um, and of course, um, I think probably the audience knows what's going on here. When you are tuning the gate, you are shifting the Fermi energy in between your Landau levels. So at some point you're bringing the uh, Fermi uh, energy at the Londo gap where you're addressing the chiral states which are ballistically traveling at the edge of your channel and um, that is giving rise to a uh, zero uh, resistance longitudinal or terminal resistance. Now uh, if we plot all these uh, oscillations of resistivity as a function of gate voltage and magnetic field we are going to have this Londo fan diagram which is quite different from what we observed earlier on for the case of graphene and chromium trichloride in that case, uh, where we had this interfacial charge transfer going on when the gate was being pushed in a particular regime. Um, but this is not the case here. We see rather like symmetric behavior for the case of um, like holes in, uh, compared with electrons. And this we are observing in like all the available gate ranges that we can access by the back gate. So the profile doesn't change, meaning that um, in our system, in graphene CPS, this gate tunable interfacial charge transfer could be largely suppressed. Now, this London fan diagram is also looking quite uh, special if you compare it with what you're expecting to see in pristine graphene. Um, well, one thing is that, um, the, the Landau fans seem to be having a slight nonlinearity. And um, for that, we can think of what is uh, going on with respect to the magnetization dynamics of the 2D magnet. You remember that we had this spring flop transition going on. So that transition happening at small range of the field can give rise to this nonlinearity that we are observing here. But then apart from that, you see that the Londo gaps are actually quite large. So knowing uh, that there should be such dependence between the energy where the Londo levels are appearing versus the magnetic field, um, we know that there should be this linear relation between N and the field, the carrier density and the field applied. So with that, we are fitting the data points that we are getting, data points of the resistivity that we are getting above eight Tesla, because we know that above eight Tesla, the 2D magnet is fully saturated. So we, we um, limit ourselves to that range. And we fit, we fit our uh, data with uh, linear lines following this relation. And now you can compare that with what we are expecting to see in pristine graphene. You see that uh, each Landau level is shifted with respect to its counterpart in uh, pristine graphene, meaning that the Landau gaps must be larger. And larger Landau gap means that the effective total electric field that is sensed by the electrons in the system is larger. That total, mag uh, sorry, total magnetic field is larger. So that total magnetic field uh, is now extracted here per Landau level, uh, as shown here showing that even though you're applying nine Tesla, the field that is sensed by the electrons can be as large as 20 Tesla. So this excess magnetic field of, of about 10 Tesla was quite intriguing to us. So we were thinking that, okay, probably this cannot be coming from the dipolar field from the magnet because it's too large. 
So um, most likely this can be related to the induced berry curvature in the system by the proximity effect, which is acting like an effective magnetic field for the electrons. And so that shifts the Londo levels in the system. So this is another signature for the modification of the band structure in uh, band structure of graphene in the proximity of uh, these magnetic materials. So with this, I would like to uh, summarize our observations. We um, addressed spin lifetime and isotropy in graphene TMD heterostructures as a signature of a uh, large induced spin orbit coupling, the valley zim and spin orbit coupling, but not only that, but also we could realize that there is a strong Rashba spin orbit field that is induced in graphene that can give rise to Rashba Edelstein effect. We could also bring the uh, graphene in the proximity of magnetic materials to induce magnetism, where we managed to um, directly measure the spin polarization in the graphene channel to be as large as 14%. Um, and that showed us that graphene not only can uh, generate spin signal by itself, the magnetic graphene can not only generate spin signal electrically, but also thermally due to uh, the presence of spin dependence Seebeck effect. And uh, we could also measure anomalous Hall effects, which will, told us that we not only have magnetism, but also spin orbit coupling. Then we moved on to another 2D magnet, chromium phosphor sulfide, where we could detect spin flop transition by the um, uh, transport happening in the graphene. And uh, there we could bring the uh, system into the quantum Hall regime, uh, seeing rather special um, behavior of Landau fan diagrams. Um, which showed that the, um, the gaps of the Landau levels uh, are quite large, which are associated to rather, rather large magnetic field that is sensed by the electrons in the system as a consequence of um, induced berry curvature. And that induced berry curvature probably is also affecting what we are observing uh, at very small magnetic field, which brought the system very close to the quantum Hall regime already at zero external magnetic field. And with this, I would like to uh, acknowledge all the people who have been involved in um, all these uh, projects at both University of Groningen and TU Delft. And of course, our collaborators at uh, Columbia University, Group of Xavier Roy, who provided us with chromium sulfur bromide crystal, and also from Valencia University, who provided us with chromium phosphor sulfide crystals. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. You get the applause from the audience, as you can see. Um, so uh, for those people that would like to ask the questions, please uh, raise your hands and then I will promote you or allow you to speak if it depends on how you set up is. So Vlad, if you like uh, to go ahead and ask your question, please. Yeah, my, maybe I have one about one of the middle slides about uh, CSB graphene magnetic metal uh, structure. Uh, did you uh, use a magnetic metal as a gate to play with the percentage of uh, magnet resistance effect? That that was uh, uh, the previous slide, I think. Um, the one where I'm you referring yeah, to the three term. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, the question was that did I use the magnetic metal to gate? Yeah, the so you. In, in this geometry, you can use cobalt as a top gate. Uh, and then uh, as you work with bilayer, you can uh, you know, get to lower doping. And uh, basically, as it is a bilayer and asymmetric conditions, it will have a gap. And then you can enhance, in principle, you can enhance the percentage of magnet resistance. Uh, right. So in order to have efficient gating, then you need to have a um, reasonable like tunnel barrier in a sense there. So you could, for example, uh, replace aluminum oxide with bilayer graphene or trilayer, sorry, bilayer HBN or trilayer HBN, which is uh, which has shown that you can sort of uh, tune the polarization of um, uh, the interface by the bias applied. Uh, but if you want to address the gating effect, you can always rely on the back gate also um, uh, to basically tune the spin polarization of conductivity in the graphene itself. But you, you didn't try it here. 
No, we didn't try it here. So here, uh, our contacts are actually quite um, like the, 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 they are quite ohmic in a sense. So there is barely any gating happening by the bias applied to the cobalt contact. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Hans, uh, if you'd like to ask a question. Yes, uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in, in, in the quantum hall measurements. So do you have data of the quantum hall signal itself, not only of the Lando of the Rho XX data? Um, you're referring to uh, so RXY. RXY data. So do you get uh, into, yeah. the, into a good quantization regime? Uh, right. So I could show quickly uh, what we are observing here. Um, yeah, so this is what we are getting as sigma xy, um, which is having a symmetry depending on whether you're addressing positive or negative magnetic field. So the system does not behave symmetrically as a function of magnetic field. Uh, but sigma xy is showing these kinks or like semi plateaus um, that are different from what you're expecting in, in pristine graphene case. So here, for example, um, we are having like a uh, level at four and eight, which is different at, a, at the negative magnetic field applied. So here we have a plateau at two and six. Is this, so it, is this it's a texture magnet. graphene or is it uh, made by, by transfer? Uh, it's made by transfer, exfoliation and transfer. And I mean, I'm from metrology, from the Metrology Institute. So uh, we are interested in the quantum anomalous Hall effect as, at as low fields as possible. So if you would get the two plateau, Lando level two plateau to a low field, let's say, nowadays you can operate a quantum Hall standard out of graphene at four Tesla and four Kelvin, and you get the quantization, which is uh, perfect down to one part in 10 to the minus nine or a few parts in 10 to the minus nine. So what would make such a system interesting if you could get the same quantization or similar quantization accuracy at a field below one Tesla, because then you could just use a permanent magnet in your Christet. So do right. you think this, this could be achieved? Um, well, I think that it requires more exploration, uh, but so far we are seeing that at small magnetic fields, uh, there is a finite induced magnetic field sensed by the graphene. So um, I think it requires further exploration for what okay, you're Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Now, uh, is there any more questions from the audience? I have a question, but maybe I want to make sure. Oh, Gisela, hang on a second. To see Gisela there. She's coming to join us. Uh, in a second. It takes about a second to, to come back to the panelists. Okay, Gisela, go ahead and ask your question, please. Unfortunately, I have no camera with me at the moment. I have maybe a silly question. Why don't you use direct ferromagnetic van der Waals layers instead of these antiferromagnetic device or layer? Um, right, so we could also go for the ferromagnetic uh, layers. The thing is that uh, if it is about the proximity effect, what matters to you is only the outermost layer. So we don't really care if the other layers underneath are anti-ferromagnetically coupled with the layer on top. Uh, so we could definitely go to also ferromagnetic uh, materials. Um, there is not much of a difference if it is about the proximity effect. Uh, only we have to limit ourselves to to the uh, 2D magnets, um, no matter whether it's anti-ferromagnet or ferromagnet, that is, uh, well, um, like not conductive. It's It has to be an insulator. Uh, mm -hmm. And also its band alignment with respect to graphene should be as such that there is not much of charge transfer going on. So that's an important part to the story. And also these 2D magnets that I have selected um, are air stable. So that makes the... Uh, yeah, yeah. application okay. process simpler. Okay. Uh, I, I just wanted to add one more thing is that um, like if there are also some magnets that are uh, anti-ferromagnet within the plane, that would change the situation because then the, the graphene would uh, not face a ferromagnet as a top layer, but it, it is facing an anti-ferromagnet within the layer. 
so um, we try to avoid those and only go with the one that is at least interlayer antiferromagnet so that the outermost layer is a ferromagnet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Falco, uh, Vlad, do you have a... Yeah, the, so can, can we go back to the yeah, slide no, with, uh, with whole conductivity? Uh, with whole conductivity? The ones you, you, uh, you were showing, um, uh, answering Hans's question. Oh, I see. All right. Yes. Uh, yeah, so you're pointing at uh, filling factor three is a plateau. Is it really uh, a series uh, claim or because what, what is funny here is that you don't have one at one but then you get three which would require both spin uh, and value degeneracy is lifted um, um, right so I am have, but you don't have a plateau at one which which would be expected more than plateau at three because uh, it, it always is promoted by exchange um, um, in, in the monolayer to have, well, to happen at smaller field factors. I understand. Uh, well, we are not still fully understanding this behavior. It is, um, I'm just highlighting that there is a kink or plat plateau-like feature there at uh, three E squared over H. Um, so, yeah, like um, I cannot really elaborate further on uh, what we are observing here. It's just that there is a strong asymmetry, which is also quite surprising in this case. Um, and the fact that the um, the sequence of the levels, so here I'm not having the data right now, uh, but the sequence of the levels up to uh, higher fill fa filling factors is uh, going to be like 2, 6, and then 10, uh, and 14 on, on the negative side. And then on the positive side, it is uh, shifted by two e squared over h. So it is going to be from four to eight and then 12 um, and so on. So um, this asymmetry there, uh, we were thinking that probably it's coming from the fact that um, there is uh, like berry curvature and magnetism uh, together with like uh, spin orbit coupling that can act uh, differently for the positive field and the negative field because the spin orbit term is not going to change sign when you are changing the magnetic field. Um, but the exchange field is, is changing sign depending on the field applied. Uh, but the elaboration over the actual levels that we are seeing here, I think it's not fully clear to us. So uh, we just leave it with what it is for now. <laughs> That's why I didn't want to highlight it too much in, in my talk. But somebody asked, so I had it's to. Very this. interesting. It's quite unusual. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? I have a question regarding a little bit. Uh, oh, Vlad, did you have another question? Yeah, you. Um, regarding the the uh, so this is about primarily at the integer quantum Hall effect. Uh, do you have in suspended systems? Have you tried to achieve the fractional quantum Hall effect regime? Uh, no, unfortunately, these are our like first observations of the quantum hall regime in the system. Um, but uh, probably in my future experiments, I will try to reach the fractional quantum hall regime as well. Yeah, it's just that the mobility. The mobility, is the, mobility is not going to, the, the challenge is going to be the mobility. Is to yeah, exactly. The mobility is about uh, 2,500 uh, centimeters square per volt second. So it's yeah, quite not, clear not, for the graphene, not, yeah. Not. But uh, we will see. Maybe we can uh, make higher quality devices. And maybe I can ask you because I'm, I haven't really followed the, the, the graphene community in that in that sense too much. In, in here, have there been samples? I thought in the Kim had done uh, this levitated ones that you could get to that regime sometimes. But I wasn't sure if they tried ever to do some lithography where you can actually create those tunneling uh, of the quasi particles uh, like they've done recently um, in the. The gamma, you know, the the the, uh, the quantum wells. Uh, is that the possibility in the future to do? Um, like well, the anion I'm quasi not, particles. I'm not so uh, sure. Okay. I am not so sure, but uh, now I am uh, in Kim's lab, so I'm yeah. hoping that they will learn more about what are the possibilities here in the quantum hall regime. Yeah, I was just trying to see if any of the statistics, uh, short noise statistics, uh, had been tried to be observed there, because uh, I would thought that it would be a fairly clean system if it's possible to get to that regime. 
Right. But it would be interesting. That sounds like a good idea. I will I will try to dig into that and yeah. see if it, it may, is. It may be not possible. Uh, it has been yeah. a challenge. But I think I saw recently, a year ago, two years ago, um, a recent paper on success on the quantum wells, but uh, it's been a long time coming. Okay. Uh, so if if there's no other thing, I'm going to try to stop the streaming and thank uh, the, I think it was about 90